I'm uh, Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this policy forum, Mobilizing Men as Partners for Women, Peace, and Security. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our partners for this event, One Earth Future Foundation and their program, Our Secure Future, Women Make the Difference. I'd also like to thank Ambassador Don Steinberg for his leadership on this issue. As uh, I know all of you are aware, this event comes uh, near the end of the 63rd session of the Commission on the Status of Women. And um, we've had an incredible uh, CSW at IPI, I have to say, with a range of great events and substantive discussions. I, uh, I see some familiar people in the room, so I know many of you have, have taken part in those sessions. And I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the great work of our, of our team, of our events team uh, that staffs each one of these events. Thanks, John, Amanda, Beatrice, the rest of the crew, the, uh, the multimedia team back there who are unsung heroes of our webcast and such. Um, and most of all, I'd like to thank uh, Sarah, Sarah Taylor, um, who heads our Women, Peace, and Security program for all her engagement over the course of the past two weeks. So it's, um, I think it's been a great CSW, but when I sat down to prepare my remarks for today, I confess it was a, a, a bit earlier round of convening that, that came to mind. In November, Sarah and I attended the Council of Europe's annual World Forum for Democracy, um, and the theme was gender equality, whose battle? Um, it was framed as a question, which was striking to me, because to pose it as a question, whose battle, suggests that some of us can sit out the battle. Um, that we can decide this doesn't affect us, or that our own behavior is not worthy of reflection. Um, but a growing body of research that I think many are familiar with in this room uh, demonstrates that gender inequality affects all of us uh, negatively. And this is quite clear in the area of peace and security. Research by Valerie Hudson and others has shown that um, the best predictor of a country's peacefulness is not its economic status, it's not its level of democracy or its religious or ethnic composition, it's how well its women are treated. So simply whose battle is uh, gender equality, it's everyone's battle. And this is very much a universal agenda. Women make the difference, women's leadership is critical, but this work very much includes men as allies, as partners, and as uh, self-aware, proactive advocates. Because it is not just about the rights of women, although maybe that should be enough. Um, it is about a more peaceful and prosperous world for everyone. Uh, and it's about getting the job done. So we have a great panel to discuss uh, all of this, uh, discuss mobilizing men as partners in this very good work. Um, but before that, we will have further opening remarks from Ambassador Anrahul Chowdhury, former permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations, and former UN high representative for least developed countries, landlocked developed countries, and small island states, and long known champion for these issues. Uh, but first, we will hear from Under Secretary General Ana Maria Menendez, Senior Advisor on Policy to the UN Secretary General, who is personally overseeing the gender parity strategy of the SG. And some of you might have seen the Pass Blue uh, interview that was circulated this morning, uh, or maybe uh, yesterday, I saw it this morning. Um, she was the subject of an excellent interview there, and uh, I recommend it to everyone. In that interview, she makes the case, quote, what you need to do is make men and women own the idea that equality is good. There is no other way. Uh, I agree. Thank you for that. <laughs> Madam Under Secretary General, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for inviting me. And uh, let me just uh, be uh, very frank with you from the very beginning. I think that what we need the most is more women in peace and security, more women negotiating at the peace table, making decisions in governments, passing laws in parliaments, presiding in courtrooms, leading their communities, 
changing the face of the security sector and having an equal say in how we reconstruct societies, how we heal from conflict, and how we prevent it in the first place. So we need more women in our international institutions, starting with the UN. And precisely because, as the Secretary General has said, we need to really set the example. This is the reason why we are working on the gender parity uh, strategy, because we think that uh, we cannot say to others, hey, you need to have more women, when we don't have the women at the senior leaders. And uh, thank God that we have that made a, a big stride on that, and the Secretary General has really appointed many women, and we are really now um, almost close to the parity um, target uh, as far as the senior leadership is concerned. But of course now we need really to, to have this trickle down and really go to all the levels of the organization. Sadly for all of us, we are not there yet. And we are not even close to having more women in the uh, peace and security world. We know that most of the gatekeepers, the policy makers, the warlords, the blue helmets, the mediators, the diplomats, the arm dealers, the arm bearers are all men. And this is why initiatives like this one uh, are very important and can help us get there. I think it matters that Ambassador Steinberg is a veteran of 1325, as is Ambassador Chowdhury, as uh, also is um, uh, Yusuf Mahmoud, both of whom, um, by the way, uh, served a, on the high-level advisory board on the Global Study on Security C uh, Council Resolution 1325. They and other men have been in this journey with us for a long time and have built up a history of activism on women, peace, and security. To be clear, the women who started, grew, and sustained this movement want the men to share the burden and recognize the effectiveness of having men speaking to other men about these issues. But they also want male allies to use their power to provide a platform and amplify the voices of women, to step up to the plate asking, how can I help? And actually listen listen to their experience and expertise, and to expand their political capital for this agenda when it counts, away from the applause of events and articles. And we have the, uh, the examples of what this looks like. Recently, General Patrick Kamayert accepted a short-term assignment to head the verification of the ceasefire agreed to in Stockholm by the parties to the conflict in Yemen. General Kamar has been working on women, peace, and security for several years now, and is hugely effective in talking to other military men in their language about these issues. It was no surprise that when uh, I heard from others that, that when he was visiting hospitals in Yemen, he would ask, where are the women, and can I talk to them? So instead of all male delegations of staff and representatives ready to, ready to speak with him, he would spend time with the female medical staff and was able to get a much richer understanding of the context as well as the violations being perpetrated and their consequences. In Colombia, our mission has the best numbers in our history when it comes to gender balance. And part of the reason is that the head of our missions there was, as you know, at the start, Jean Arnaud. And he spent a lot of his time not just talking about the importance of women in peace operations, but talking about action and making sure that his mission would reflect this. From tirelessly lobbying the countries, deploying the military observers, to complementing them with much higher numbers of women in the civilian components, so that all the local teams would have a good mix of both. Again, no surprise there. Back in the 1990s, when 1325 has not been adopted yet, and uh, the issue of women, peace, and security didn't have the global footprint that it has now, 
Arnaud already used his position as mediator of the civil war in Guatemala to open up spaces for women's direct engagement in the talks. So these are examples. There are other like them. There are other men like them. And we need many more like them. And this is what this new network is about. This is especially important in the current global policy climate, where we see backlash against feminist gains and advocacy, and a pushback against inclusion in general, not just for women. I'm hopeful that this new network will recruit the next generations of male champions and allies. You can count on the United Nations' continued commitment to this agenda, because we see it as central to achieving our broader goals, not only uh, peace, but also sustainable development. I will end with the Secretary General's own words at the opening of CSW this year. Let's collective work together, men and women, to, and he said, push back against the pushback and change the current status quo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I see friends here. Our moderator, Sarah, is here. Ambassador Steinberg, of course, and um, other colleagues in the podium. I'm wishing you all an energizing spring equinox taking place later today. This is a day of planetary significance, as you say. Dare I say that our visionary event this afternoon is of immense significance to humanity. I recall a story, and I share it with many people. In January 2000, President Nelson Mandeva came to speak to the Security Council or as a facilitator of the Burundi peace process. And we were meeting, I was in the council at that time, we were meeting and he told us a story. Madiba said that he tried his best to get men to agree to inclusion of women in the peace table. He found strong resistance, so he told the women to come in the evening to his living area and say that maybe I can hear you. And then next morning, he would share some of his thoughts with the peace, formal peace table with men. And they said, oh, Madiba, those are good ideas. <laughs> and he told them that those are not my ideas. Those are the ideas I got last evening from women who came to meet me and share their thoughts. And that is the value that women bring in. Women equal half of humanity bring a new breadth, quality, and balance of vision to our common efforts to move away from the cult of war towards the culture of peace. Women's equality makes our planet safe and secure. Currently, the Commission on Status of Women is having its annual session. This year's report placed before the Commission underlined that unfortunately, overall progress towards gender equality had been unacceptably slow, with stagnation and even regression in some areas. Women's rights are under threat from a backlash. Uh, Anna Maria mentioned about pushback. Secretary General is talking about pushback. Backlash of conservatism and fundamentalism around the world. Secretary General Guterres mentioned everywhere we still have a male-dominated culture. My work has taken me to the farthest corners of the world, and I have seen time and again, the centrality of women's equality in our lives. This realization has now become more pertinent in the midst of the ever-increasing 
militarism and militarization that is destroying both our planet and our people. The United Nations Charter has given the responsibility for international peace and security to the Security Council. For 55 years since its establishment, Security Council found women as only helpless victims of war and conflicts without recognizing their positive contribution. On 8th of March, on the International Women's Day on 2000, as the President of the Security Council, I could mobilize the Council to recognize in a statement agreed upon by everybody that peace is inextricably linked with equality between women and men, and affirmed the value of full and equal participation of women at all decision-making levels. This is when the seed for the Resolution 1325 was sown, which was later on adopted in October of that year. The Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 was given to three women leaders. In its citation, the Nobel Committee referred to 1325 and asserted that, and I quote, we cannot achieve democracy and lasting peace in the world unless women obtain the same opportunities as men to influence developments at all levels of society, end of quote. It is a reality that politics, more so security, is a man's world. Empowered women bring important and different skills, perspectives to the policy-making table in comparison to their male counterparts. The slogan for the global campaign on women, peace and security, which we launched in London in June 2014, reiterates, and I quote, if we are serious about peace, we must take women seriously, end of quote. Patriarchy and misogyny are the dual scourges pulling back the humanity, away from our aspiration for a better world to live in freedom, equality and justice. Men and policies and institutions controlled by them have been the main perpetrators of gender inequality which is a real threat to human progress. Feminism is a smart policy, which is inclusive, uses all potentials, and leaves no one behind. I am proud to be a feminist. All of us need to be. That is how we make our planet a better place to live for all. For the two-year initiative, being launched this afternoon, all of us should take the vow to profess, advocate, and work to ensure feminism as our creed and as our mission. We should always remember, and I have said this again and again, that without peace, development is impossible. And without development, peace is not achievable, but Without women, neither peace nor development is conceivable. Thank you. Ambassador Chowdhury, USG, thank you so much. And Adam, as well as IPI's, one of IPI's in-house male champions. Um, thank you so much for these stirring and important framing remarks for our conversation today. My name is Sarah Taylor. I lead IPI's Women, Peace, and Security program here. I am delighted that we are partnering on this event, and I'd like to add my, my welcome to the partners and to all of you, to Adams. Um, we are going to start today's program with some additional framing points from Ambassador Steinberg. Uh, by way of introduction, Ambassador Donald Steinberg serves as Senior Fellow for the NGO Umbrella Organization Interaction. Uh, he is also executive director of Mobilizing Men as Partners for Women, Peace, and Security. His biography is long and full of concrete support 
uh, for women, peace, and security issues, including um, teaching poverty eradication at Dartmouth College, president of World Learning. Um, he has worked at the US Agency for International Development, at the US State Department, um, at the White House, um, as a special Haiti coordinator, and he was the ambassador to Angola. Um, some of you might also know him from his time as deputy president at International Crisis Group. Um, but I'm particularly delighted to welcome Don here as a real champion on women, peace, and security issues, and to thank him for his work on this. The floor is yours. Great. And thank you, Sarah. Uh, and let me begin by saying how stirring those comments were, Ambassador Chowdhury, Undersecretary Menendez. Uh, I sort of feel like I should just say ditto at this point, but uh, they're not paying me for just a few words. Uh, <laughs> I also wanted to thank uh, IPI, our Secure Future Strategy for Humanity, and dozens of other groups who have brought us here today for the launch of this initiative, mobilizing men as partners for women, peace, and security. And thanks to all of you for joining us here today. I live in Washington, DC, and right now there's a lot of discussion about whether we're facing an emergency. And for me, there's no question we are. But the emergency isn't what's happening on the US southern border. It's the collapse of our global conflict resolution system. When 70 million people around the world are driven from their homes by conflict that seems intractable, when countries like South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, Venezuela, and more are aflame in conflict with no end in sight, when women in Afghanistan fear that the progress they've achieved since 2001 will be sacrificed on the altar of false peace with the Taliban, yes, there's an emergency. And it requires nothing less than a wholesale reordering of our male-dominated global security priorities. I'm one of those who see the glass as half full. There has been impressive progress in international norms and practices on the WPS agenda since the Beijing conference a quarter century ago. But our success can't be measured by how many Security Council resolutions we pass, how many 1325 national action plans we adopt, or even how many women serve as leaders and participants in peace process. Instead, our success will be measured by whether these peace processes can actually bring just and lasting ends to conflict, whether women and other marginalized populations can fully develop their potential and contribute to their society, and whether violence ceases to be the default setting for disputes in war zones, in communities, and in private homes as well. Today's launch has its roots in a WPS program held at Georgetown University a couple years ago. One panel included former Secretary Hillary Clinton, Under Secretary of Defense Michelle Flournoy, and Ambassadors Samantha Power and Milan Vivere. And of course, with that lineup, there was a packed crowd. Almost all of them were women. We left the stage and Secretary Clinton turned to me and whispered, Don, where are all the men? <laughs> and it's a sad truth, but while men continue to dominate the global security network, they have been missing in action on this front for, we, uh, for women, peace, and security. And so we decided to do something about it. We reached out to prominent global women and men in defense, diplomacy, development, and civil society. And we brought together 80 former generals, ambassadors, government ministers, NGO presidents, and others who are committed to engendered peace processes. We came together a year ago at CSW, and we were hoping to launch our advocacy coalition at that time. But we soon realized there were too many unanswered questions that we needed to address. These included questions like, were our goals simply to have more durable peace processes, 
or were we equally committed to a rights-based approach seeking to change gender power dynamics and address toxic masculinity? We had to address how were we going to ensure that men didn't seek to dominate or supplant women's leadership, but instead serve as allies, as partners, as supporters who shunned mansplaining. How could we enhance the leadership and amplify the voices of grassroots advocates, ensuring them equal access to the corridors of power? Should we focus as well on groups who are marginalized by other identity factors, including disability and ethnicity and religion, displacement, sexual orientation and gender identity? And so we went back to the drawing board and spent an entire year doing consultations with scores of stakeholders. The counsel they provided is reflected in the charter and the guiding principles that we're releasing here today for mobilizing men as partners. Our goals over the next two years are quite simple. First of all, we will use our connections and our behind the scenes access to formal and informal leaders of the international community national governments and beyond to press for engendered peace processes and to open doors for activists who are fully capable of speaking for themselves. Second, we'll engage with leaders of processes in Afghanistan, South Sudan, Yemen, and beyond to ensure they include women and other marginalized groups in negotiating and implementation bodies and give full weight to their contribution. Third, we'll serve as watchdogs to ensure that the UN Security Council resolutions, national action plans, UN and regional peacekeeping missions, and national laws, including the US Women, Peace, and Security Act of 2017, are fully and transparently implemented. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we will support activists on the front lines of conflict to build their capacity and to ensure their personal security because we all know that the world's most dangerous professions are women peacemakers and human rights defenders. And that's especially true in an era when we're seeing a closing of civil society space and a pushback. We hope that all of you will join us. At the end of this program, our Secure Future Director, Sahana Dhammapura, We'll say a few words about how you can engage with our network of partners. But for me, for now, I'd just like to conclude with one last thought. Experience and empirical evidence, as Adam referred to, has shown the tragic cost in lives and resources resulting from failed peace processes involving only men. This isn't just a problem for one gender. These failures threaten us all. Countries mired in recurring conflict are far more likely to traffic in drugs, in people, and in weapons, to send off waves of refugees across borders and oceans, to incubate and transmit pandemic diseases, to destabilize their neighbors, to harbor criminal networks, pirates, and terrorists, and to need foreign military and humanitarian support. So the burden isn't on us to explain why women need to be part of this process. Given all of these security challenges, how can we not put women's leadership and empowerment at the top of our global security to-do list? Thank you. Don, thank you so much. Um, I would just really like to emphasize that as Don and others have noted, this is, of course, a universal agenda. Addressing constructions of masculinity and femininity in power structures, particularly related to peace and security, is no easy task. And as we've heard about the development of this initiative, addressing the specific ways, the hows of male allyship at all levels can also be a challenging task. 
But of course, if we're going to move forward on the core of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda and everything that that means on ensuring that this is recognized and implemented as a universal agenda, then these are necessary tasks, tasks to be done in a considered, even humble, certainly feminist way. So we have a fantastic panel to discuss just these issues. I'm going to quickly um, uh, give you an idea of who's up on the, the, uh, the panel with me, and then I'll turn it over to them for their insights and comments. Um, we have uh, Mickey Jasevich, uh, who's also a longtime ally on this issue. Um, he's currently vice chair at the Institute for Inclusive Security and a fellow at Our, Our Secure Future um, and is a professor at various universities. His extensive biography includes directing conflict resolution programming in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Sudan, managing country programs in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Colombia, and Liberia. Um, he has been instrumental in building an inclusive Afghan peace and reconstruction program, Liberian post-conflict development strategies, and Colombian transitional justice initiatives. Um, a number of you might actually know Mickey from his extensive work and expertise assisting 40 countries in developing, implementing, and evaluating national action plans on 1325. Uh, we will then hear from making sure that I have this in the right order. I do. Uh, we will then be honored to hear from Ms. Fatima al Bahadli, uh, who is the director of Al Firdwas Society, an NGO founded in June 20, uh, 2003, based in Basra um, in Iraq. Uh, the society is dedicated to promoting women's rights and the enhancement of women's economic and political participation. Uh, she works actively to address extremism among youth and children, to stop their involvement in armed groups, and to work on the integration of former fighters into society by providing psychological and social support programs. She also works on strengthening women's roles in negotiation and peace building. I'd also like to say thank you uh, to um, Afaf al um, al Kash Mama, I'm so sorry. I practiced, I swear I practiced, um, who is very kindly providing interpretation for us today. Uh, we will also be hearing from Karen Landgren, who is currently the Executive Director of Security Council Report. But prior to this, many of you will also know her from her uh, service within the United Nations for over 35 years, including as the first woman to have headed three UN peace operations mandated by the Security Council. Um, until 2015, she was a UN Undersecretary General, head of the UN Mission in Liberia, um, has le led UNMEL's response to Ebola. Um, she's led two political missions, including the UN Office in Burundi and the UN Mission in Nepal. And she is also, I'm exhausted just listening to this <laughs> biography, um, she's also a founding member of the Nordic Women Mediators Network um, and has also taught at Columbia University and Central European University. So now you know the backgrounds and expertise that we've brought to the table and why we're so delighted about this. I'm going to turn to Mickey first. Mickey, I think we'd love to hear you, about your experiences um, in, as I said, the preparation of the national action plans um, uh, from your perspective and how men can best serve as partners as in the implementation and promotion of this agenda. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And um, I want to start by saying two excuses. One is English as a fourth language, coupled with the jet lag caused by a trip from Bangladesh via Jakarta on my way to Melbourne tomorrow only because of this guy. <laughs> no, I'm serious. So if, if what I say doesn't make too much sense, blame it on Don. Um, but on, on all seriousness, so first, as we used to say in Liberia, where we created National Action Plan there, all protocols observed. So many great forefathers and foremothers, as well as people who continue to sustain this agenda, welcome. Um, I come from a little tiny nation called Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I want to start with a bit of a personal story, which is what we do back home. Sadly, maybe too much of history. But it dates with my beloved grandmother who at the age of seven went down to the river to see this princess that was visiting my hometown called Sarajevo. And that day, a duke was shot and the world war started. So my grandmother, she, Nana is long gone, but I say this story because what she witnessed in 1914, uh, see English is coming, 14, is the start of great war in which millions and millions of people died 
But it was the warfare of the olden times when the young men primarily were given a gun, a weapon, a bit of a training and sent out there in these battlefields to shoot at each other for years. And yes, again, many, many people died, but the primary victims were really trained young soldiers. You fast forward to my last war that I was supposedly to be a soldier in. And in that war, so the reason I'm coming to this is why I do this work and have for the last 25 years. It's just there's no other sense because you woke up in Bosnia in April of 92 or Rwanda in April of 94, etc. And as a young man, I was totally useless. I was not trained to fight in that war. That war was completely domestically focused. It was the new type of warfare in which, guess what? Men fought war, women sustained life. And so I've done this work for the last 25 years to honor all the women in my family that saved me. From my mother, who would go down and knock on the door of the UN mission and say, we need milk for the babies in our apartment building. And we have seen that work happen all over the world for the last 25 years. And so it's just nonsensical not to do it, frankly. Uh, but we are still catching up. And I've had a great privilege to be on this journey. I want to thank Don for teaching me good English because we went to see him. My big boss is Ambassador Swanee Hunt. And I had just landed off fresh off the boat, 99. And she says, you're going to go see this guy. And now it's 2000. And we are supposedly having this organization. And he's a big boss up on the seventh floor of the State Department. And I'm all shaking like he's, this is, oh my God. Like, and so Swani says, we want to create this network. We want to have women at the peace table. We want to do this and the other thing. And he says, you need a toolkit. And back in the day, I didn't have a black bear, so I couldn't Google what is a toolkit. Um, but very quickly, we did figure it out and sort of focused on creating and documenting the cases of where and how women have concretely contributed to stopping war, preventing violence, and rebuilding our countries. And so the first news I have for anybody in this or other rooms that says we need more research, please do not talk to me because I might lose my patience. We've researched enough. We have enough case studies and data. We just need to now translate this into making this happen. And um, I do, I recognize the pushback, but you know, back, back in the days after, after our war, a couple of us young men and women from the Balkans, we formed a group that wanted to build peace. And we said we can't be really optimist because after genocide happened, but we can't allow ourselves to be pessimist. So I'm still what we called ourselves post-pessimist. I really do believe we need to recognize the dangers and challenges of what I do see daily of the pushback, but also recognize the enormous power and potential of the young people, of other marginalized groups, but of the realities that women daily are indeed, even in places like Syria today, preventing war from taking even more lives. Mm -hmm. And so, and Sarah, hopefully you're timing me, but I very know. quickly to say how I do it these days are these national action plans. As we would say, alhamdulillah, today we had announced 81, which is Namibia, and we are gonna soon hopefully have Bangladesh at this illustrious list. Why they are important, they are unique platform, where through the four elements of the high impact national action plan, which are coordination across the various ministries, inclusion of civil society actors, monitoring and evaluation for the sake of impact and ability to prove the difference, and finally, ability to really sustain the implementation, you can really bring very, very strange, if you will, groups of people in the same room, which is typically, again, Build, uh, no, English. Building on the transformative potential of this agenda, we are in one room over the course of the four days I was just in Dhaka. You can get people from the security sector, which are typically still predominantly men, and the higher ranking, they tend to be older men. And you bring these often very young leaders from civil society with groups from academia to sit together and do three things. Decide what does this agenda mean in our context? What is the interpretation within the current context of conflict in our country that this number 13T5 actually means? Secondly, what is specifically that we can do together? So having, again, Ministry of Defense and Security partner with Ministries of Women's Affairs and Ministries of Finance to pay for the work that the government needs to do. And finally, more concretely, the contribution and the role of civil society, which is, again, mostly uh, women-led in most of these kinds, that gives us the ground truth about what the the peace should look like.
Thank you. Um, thank you, Mickey, and not least for your false modesty about your English. Um, uh, Thank you so much for those uh, excellent points. And just as a reminder to everyone, we will have Q&A, um, so you will have a chance to ask all of our amazing panelists um, for additional information about their experience. And I'm now going to turn to uh, Fatima. Uh, Fatima, we are really looking forward to hearing about your experience and your expertise on this issue. <laughs> بدنا أشكر شبكة آيكان وشبكة وصل لدعوتي لهذا اللقاء وأشكر معهد السلام الدولي والسيد دون ستامبريك اسمي فاطمة وأعمل ناشطة ومدافع عن حقوق الإنسان بشكل عام وحقوق المرأة بشكل خاص في جنوب العراق من سنة من خمسة عشر سنة. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good day. I'd like to thank ICANN and Wassel Network for their invitation to this event and to the International Peace Institute and Ambassador Don Steinberg. My name is Fatima and I have been uh, working as a women and a human rights defender in the south of Iraq for 15 years. بسبب اتساق عدد العنف التي يشهدها المجتمع العراقي نتيجة لتراكمات سابقة متنوعة الجذور والأسباب التي ظهرت إلى الساحة خلال الانهيار الأمني وسيطرة التنظيمات المسلحة واتسع سطوة العشائر إضافة إلى الجهات المتطرفة ظهرت الحاجة الملحة على هذا العمل في هذا الجانب عن طريق تشخيص المشكلة بتفاصيلها وتحليلها والاستراتيجيات والبرامج والمشاريع للعمل عليها والتي تنوعت بين الحد من ظاهرة تجنيد الأطفال وبين الأسلحة في الشوارع وبين اضطهاد المرأة في النزاعات العشائرية وما تدفعه النساء من ثمن تحت مسمى الفصلية والنهوة العشائرية وغسل العار تحت مسميات الشرف وأرغامهن على الانتحار وازداد عدد المتسربات في المدارس للخضوع للزواج المبكر والزواج خارج المحكمة as a result of past accumulations of various roots and reason, the base of violence has been broadening in Iraq. This violence emerged on the scene amid the collapse of security and the control of armed organizations and the expansion of tribal power in addition to extremist parties. With this emerged also the urgent needs to address the problem by diagnosing and anal analyzing thus uh, laying out the outlines, the strategies, and programs to work on these issues. These issues varied between the phenomenon of child soldier, illegal arms sales in the streets, and the, the persecution of women because of tribal conflicts. Uh, women in this situation pay the price under the pretext of issues or codes such as al-fasliya, uh, or uh, family honor, where women are sometimes forced to commit suicide. More girls are forced to, to leave school, forced into early marriage, or marriage outside the courts. لقد عملنا على عدة طرق لبناء السلام وفي سنة 2015 بدأنا عند اندلاع نزاع عشائري كانت ضحيته 51 امرأة عملنا على مع رؤساء العشائر في مناطق جميعا الذين هم مغلبهم من الرجال وتمكنا من اقناعهم للعمل معنا عن طريق استخدام المقاربات الدينية والاعراف القبلية التي تنصف المرأة وذكرنا لهم قصصا عن مشاركة النساء في الإسلام في الحياة ودورهم في قيادة المجتمع إضافة إلى الحجج التي قدمناها من قصص تأريخية عن حياة العشائر والأجداد وتكريمهم للنساء وهذا ما شجعهم للعمل معي واتخذنا من رجال الدين والمحتدلين أنصارا لنا في قضايا المرأة والضغط على زعماء القبائل بحرمة انتهاك المرأة تحت مسميات الفصلية والنهوة we worked on peace-building approaches to attempt solving these problems. In 2015, I led this dialogue after uh, a tribal conflict resulted in uh, the kidnapping of 15 women under the system or the code known as Fasliya. I initiated dialogue with the heads of tribes in my area. 
All of them were men, of course, and I was able to convince them to work with me. We used religious approaches and tribal traditions that honor women and recounted to them the stories from history of Islam about women's inclusion in, in public life and their leadership, leadership roles in society, in addition to historical stories from the lives of tribes and their ancestors and how they honored women. This encouraged them to work with me. We had allies from moderate religious leaders who pressured heads of tribes to end violation of women under codes such as al fasliya وأقنعناهم بتوقيع البروتوكول عن طريق إلزامهم بكلمات ومواثيق محلية متعارف عليها لها تأثير كبير في مجتمعنا حيث أن الرجال يحتبرون هذه الكلمات والمواثيق موقف يسجل لهم في تأريخهم وبالتالي بعد منحهم كلمة الشرف لنا كان التوقيع أمر ثانوي أقل أهمية من كلمة الشرف بالنسبة لهم وهذا ما شجعهم على التوقيع على البروتوكول وبالرغم من أن التأثير كان ضعيفا بداية الأمر لأنه لم يشمل كل القبائل إلا أن استمرارنا بالتواصل مع القبائل وزعمائها ومشاركتنا معهم في كثير من قضاياهم وحضور مناسباتهم أصبح تأثيرنا قويا فمن 2015 إلى الآن لم تسجل أي حالة فصلية أو نهوة في تلك القرى رغم أن النزاعات العشائرية ما زالت مستمرة We convinced them to sign a protocol through their commitment with verbal and local agreements that are traditional and have great impact in our societies, where men consider such words and agreements as positions going down in their history. Thus, after giving, giving me their word of honor, signing the protocol was a secondary matter. To them, it's less important than their word of honor. Although the impact was weak because it didn't include all tribes, but we continued to communicate with the rest of the tribe's leaders and we got involved in several of their issues, attended their ceremonies, and then our influence became strong. Since 2015, there hasn't been one incident in these villages, even though tribal disputes continue. وتنوعت الأنشطة الخاصة بنا ببناء السلام التي قمنا بها للحد من هذه المشاكل بين الوقفات السلمية والمبادرات المجتمعية المتنوعة واللقاءات والحوارات وجلسات المجتمعية وزيارات إلى جهات حكومية وغير حكومية ومؤسسات دينية وجهات محتدلة من تنوع المجتمع بين رصد الانتهاكات الموجهة للمرأة ونقلها إلى الجهات المختصة I have also used other peace building approaches to prevent these issues between peaceful demonstrations, community initiatives, meetings and dialogues, visits to governmental, non-governmental, and religious institutions, as well as other various sector, sectors of our society, because we wanted to monitor and document violations against women and report them to the authorities. في عام 2014 وبالتحديد في شهر حزيران دخل داعش إلى العراق مما جعل الأحداث تتسارع وصدرت فتوى من مرجعية السيدة السستاني لتعبئة الحشد لمحاربة داعش وهنا بدأت رغبة الشباب والأطفال في القتال لصد داعش وبدأوا يحملون السلاح لأن الجهاد في نظرهم هو الحصول على الجنة وقد قمنا في منظمة الفردوس بتوزيع نسخ من فتوى المرجعية التي تبين الجهاد الكفائي وليس العام وحرمة إشراك الأطفال في النزاعات المسلحة فقمنا بحوارات مع هؤلاء الشباب والأطفال ثم دعوناهم للدروس التعليمية والحوارات الدينية المعتدلة بأن الجهاد ورض الله يأتي من خلال حب الآخرين وتقديم المساعدة للمحتاجين والاهتمام بمحلاتنا وزراعتها وتنظيفها وخلال سنة ونصف استطعنا أعادة 150 طفلا إلى مدارسهم بعد أن عملنا لهم جلسات متنوعة ومبادرات مختلفة In 2014 when ISIS came to Iraq events unfolded quickly and Sayyid Sistani the highest religious reference issued a fatwa mobilizing people to fight ISIS and here emerged young people desiring to fight and we um, and they were told by the militia leaders that to please God and go to heaven, they should do jihad by carrying arms. In order to stop recruiting young boys to armed uh, groups and turn them into child soldiers, we at Al Fardaus Society distributed religious fatwas and explaining the jihad al kifai, which is different from the broad concept of jihad, about the prohibition of involving children in armed conflicts. We also held dialogues with the children under the age 18 and gave them educational sessions explaining that one earns the love of God by loving others, 
helping those in need and caring for our spaces by cleaning and building and farming. In a year and a half, 150 boys were back to schools. وحرصنا كثيرا ان يكون التماسك المجتمعي اهم برامجنا لبناء السلام فعملنا مع الاقليات في البصره للتعريف بحقوقهم والتي كفلها الدستور ومطالبه الجهات الامنيه لتوفير الحمايه لهم وبين العوائل النازحه من المدن التي قضعت لاحتلال داعش وبين العوائل المضيفه في البصره لوضع خطط الطوارئ بشراكه الحكومه المحليه وتقييم احتياجاتهم وعمل مبادرات مشتركه كطلاء المدارس وحملات التنظيف والتوعيه باهميه السلام والتعايش السلمي. We are very keen that social cohesion be our most important program for peace building. So we work to support minorities in Basra and demanded that security forces provide security for them and allow them to freely practice their religions and observe religious occasions. We also worked with we were we also worked on social cohesion between families displayed by from ISIS controlled cities and the hosting families in Basra. We partnered with local authorities to put emergency plans, evaluate their needs, and provide them with support through income-generating projects, community initiatives like painting schools, and awareness campaigns about peace and coexistence. ولا بد أن نسلط الضوء على أهمية برامج التماسك المجتمعي في المدن المحررة وتقديم الدعم النفسي والاجتماعي للأطفال والنساء والشباب في تلك المدن فدع اشترك ألاف من الأطفال والنساء والشباب من يحملون منهجا مؤدلجا على العنف والتطرف وعدم الاهتمام بهؤلاء النساء والأطفال والشباب سيوسع قاعدة التطرف والعنف من جديد ويساعد على إنشاء تنظيمات تكفيرية جديدة شبيهة بتنظيم داعش الإرهابي we must shed light, light on the importance of social cohesion programs in the liberated cities and providing the psychosocial supports to women and children and youth in those cities. ISIS left thousands carrying an ideology of violence and extremism. And ignoring these women and children and youth will expand the base of extremism and violence all over again and will help establish new extremist organizations similar to, similar to ISIS. ولا بد ان نسلط الضوء على اهميه برامج التماسك المجتمعي في المدن المحروره، بعد تحرير الاراضي من سيطره داعش برزت قضايا مهمه في المجتمع يجب العمل عليها من خلال عوده المحاربين للمجتمع وكيفيه تقديم الدعم النفسي والمجتمعي لتقليل حالات العنف داخل اسرهم ومجتمعاتهم، فعملنا على تقييم اهم احتياجاتهم ووضع البرامج التي تساعدهم على الخروج من حالات العنف. وإضافة بالتالي فإن الاهتمام بهم أمر ضروري لكونهم الشريحة الكبيرة من الشباب وضرورة حمايتهم وضرورة حماية المجتمع من تصرفاتهم وبالتالي فإن عدم رعايتهم الخاصة ستنتج جيلا يشكل خطرا على المجتمع والتماسك إذ لديهم خوف وعدم محبة للآخر المختلف معهم عقائديا وفكريا وبالتالي يشكلون تهديدا وخطرا على وحدة المجتمع After the liberation from ISIS some critical issues arose that needed attention. One of them is the returning fighters to the society and how to provide them with psycho psychological and so psychosocial support to dec decrease domestic violence as well as violence in their communities. We work to evaluate their needs and put programs in place to assist them in breaking the cycle of violence and change their mindsets to peace. These fighters now hold ideologies of violence and that's clear in their dealings with their families or the society, especially after losing the financial resources coming from the fight, as well as their feelings of loss and identity issues in relation to society. Thus, it's of highest importance to care for them as they are a large segment of the youth. It's also important to protect them and protect the community from them. Not giving them adequate support will produce a generation of children that pose danger to the society and its cohesion as they will have fear and hate of the other. ونجد من الضرور الملحة لإشراك الرجال في الترويج لعمليات السلام هو أمر مهم وحساس في ذات الوقت حيث أن أغلب حالات العنف واستخدام السلاح هي تصرفات تمارس من قبل الرجال وبالتالي فإن تغيير مفاهيم الرجال عن طريق أنشطة متنوعة وذات فترات زمنية ليست بقصرية هو أمر مهم في هذا الجانب من أجل إيجاد رجال والشباب يرغبون ومقتنعين بذلك من أجل الترويج الفعلي لعمليات السلام وإشراك النساء في بناء السلام والحد من الظواهر والمجتمعات والتصرفات التي تؤثر وتزعزع بناء السلام وحفظ السلام. We believe it's crucial to involve men in promoting peace. It's a sensitive issue 
because in most cases, violence and using weapons are acts perpetrated by men. Therefore, changing men's perception through various activities and over long periods of time is of critical importance because we need men who are convinced and have the desire to actively promote the peace agenda, involve women in peace building, and put an end to societal issues that disturb peace building. وفي الختام أتمنى أن ينقل صوتنا كمدافعات وناشطات في مجال حقوق الإنسان وحقوق المرأة وبناء السلام إلى أهمية إشراك النساء في الحوار والتفاوض من خلال بناء قدراتهم في كثير من المؤسسات النسوية لا تزال ضعيفة ومحدودة التأثير في هذا المجال وخصوصا في البلدان النامية بل أن دورها لا يكاد يذكر بالشأن مساهمة المرأة في منع النزاعات وأحلال السلام وهي حقيقة لا بد من الإقرار بها وحتى المنظمات الدولية التي لها خبرة على صعيد المعمل الإنسان هي الأخرى لا تلبي طموحات مشاركة المرأة وإضافة إلى ذلك أن بعض النساء يتجاهلن مثل هذا الدور الذي يراد أن يناط بهن لوجود معارضة ليست بقليلة بخصوص مشاركتهن في ظل سيادة العقلية الذكورية وإذا كانت المشاركة النسائية في منع الحروب وحل النزاعات وبناء السلام ضعيفة على المستوى العالمي فإن هذا الضعف ظاهر في منطقتنا ويكفي أن نلقي نظرة على حقيقة الأوضاع في العراق وفي حالة صراع مستديم تؤكد ذلك مرة أخرى شكرا لكم جميعا وشكرا لحسن الأصغاء In conclusion, I do hope that our voices as human and women rights defenders and as peace builders are heard when we speak of the importance of including women in negotiations by building their capacities. The undeniable fact is that many women-led organizations are still weak and with little impact in this field, especially in developing countries, to the point where their roles in conflict resolution and peace building are ignored. Even international organizations with experience in humanitarian work do not meet women's aspirations of inclusion. Moreover, some women ignore such roles because of pressure against their participation and the hegemony of uh, patriarchal thinking. And if women's inclusion in preventing wars, conflict resolution and peace building is weak internationally, this week is more prevalent in our region. When look at the reality of the situation in Iraq, which is a special case of prolonged conflict confirms that. Again, thank you for your listening. Shukran, thank you so much for your for helping us to understand your work um, and the clear call to action about the degree of resourcing time that this takes uh, to do this work, to do this work right. Thank you so much. Karen, I turn to you for the final comments on this panel before we open to the floor. Um, we'd love to hear your perspectives, particularly given the current global context, but from your experience as an SRSG, um, how men can best serve as partners in promoting this agenda. Thank you, Sarah, and let me start by congratulating Don Steinberg on this initiative. Fittingly, his email address, as some of you know, is Daydream Believer. <laughs> so thanks also to all those who've lent their support uh, to this. Several years ago, a friend tried to interest me in her theory that the growing role of women in public life was a factor in the phenomenal rise of strong men, of autocratic male leaders around the world. At the time, I thought this sounded far-fetched. I've changed my mind. Many men seem to take a zero-sum approach to women increasing their share of anything, including a voice and a representation. If I ever broached the idea of quotas for women, as I sometimes did, even my extremely reasonable male friends would, metaphorically speaking, reach for their revolvers <laughs> and start to talk about lowering of standards as if current selection systems yeah. for male leaders are all about high standards. <laughs> so there is pushback, whether it's the backlash within the UN itself to gender balance strategies, or at the level of nations where groups find and organize around real or imagined threats to their social position. As a former SRSG and an advocate for the 1325 Agenda, I have found it useful that an important argument for women's greater engagement 
is the gender neutral outcome of longer lived peace agreements. Framing outcomes as better for all, as is also done around uh, girls' education and in maternal health, seems like a no-brainer. But we're also confronted by another reality uh, of recent years, which is popular rejection of evidence-based arguments. What if better outcomes don't matter as much as having the comfort of one's own worldview and biases confirmed and reinforced. So this context makes male allies especially important. You asked about my experiences as SRSG, and I won't tell a poignant anecdote, but I'll put three conclusions on the table. I thought as the last speaker, I might you know, be asked to keep it to two minutes instead no, no, of five. No, 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 no. It's just the time. <laughs> but I did prepare for that. So the three conclusions uh, are these. One is that the role modeling effect is very strong. Uh, one takeaway from my time as SRSG in Liberia was the value of my excellent relationship with our longest serving force commander. Being the commanding officer of a major general has its own impact. But I'm talking less about hierarchy and more about the value of demonstrating mutual trust and respect between male and female leaders wherever we went. And he was a partner in that. Second, more than ever, I'm convinced that men hear other men more effectively than they hear women. So like it or not, not, uh, the world over, there seems to be widespread discounting of uh, male discounting of truth spoken in a female voice. Now, one way forward is, of course, more female voices. But for now, it galls me. But if we want effective communication and outreach, there need to be more male voices, not simply relating the evidence, but persuading others at a more visceral level yeah. of the value of women holding power. Third, the weakest element of 1325 in practice is gendered analysis, understanding the differential impact of policy on men and on women. This is also a lesson from my time as SRSG. The other elements, uh, whether it's about uh, sexual violence or representation, actually come more uh, instinctively to uh, people and the senior leadership to apply. So gendered analysis, it's hard enough as outsiders to understand how other societies work. And it's also hard not simply to substitute our own experiences for other people's lived realities. So I would like yeah. to see more men taking a lead in undertaking gendered analysis and then taking responsibility for translating those findings into policy. I don't want to see men monopolizing the leadership of women, peace, and security. But I have also seen that women can be reluctant to propel themselves onto the front lines. And we need both men and women to pull other women into leadership roles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. It, really, I feel like the points are so salient. I'm really struck by the demonstration of mutual respect um, and the message and that, that that conveys. Uh, we have time now for Q&A. So we have microphones. Um, if you have a question, I think I'll collect three to begin with. Um, if there are any questions for our panelists, I would just ask that you, um, that you uh, Keep your comments brief, if possible. Um, and also just say your name and your organization. OK, so I've got my three. I've got one there, one here, one there. Okay. Thank you so much for giving the, me this opportunity. And thank to all the presenters for the wonderful insight about the women and men support to women agenda. My name is Nguyen Susan Sebit. I'm a South Sudanese, but I'm a Cora Wise Peace Building Fellow with the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. I'm here in New York. <laughs> so um, 
Uh, the Global Network of Women Peace Builders is uh, very passionate about the localization program of the 1325. And in most of the localization programs, they are trying to, we are trying to, to ensure that men and boys are part of the localization programs and to implement the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in, in all the and other initiatives anyway. So my question goes like this, how do we support, or I mean, how do men support the women peace and security agenda without claiming the space of women? Because at some point, men and boys could be mobilized, but we never know there might be women and girls support, but at some point they will claim the space and push out the women in a state of supporting them. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Martha Kibalo. I represent the women's, uh, sorry, World Federation of Ukrainian Women's Organizations. We have a project jointly with the United Methodist Women that we call uh, the Women's Peace Dialogue Platform. It is of five years longevity already, and we uh, strive to uh, embrace women peace builders from across what we want to avoid post-Soviet sphere, but in fact, that's what we're talking about. Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Ukraine, Russia. Um, common experience, some in that area, also a lot of pushback on this kind of. Our ultimate vision is to have a mediator's network similar to the others that have arisen. And my question really is, now that we have gathered up or in the process of recruiting and gathering up, um, what are the interfaces that you envision that we can pursue? What are the practical steps that we can take to stop churning energy and starting to break open some doors and see who can help us in, male or female? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Mohammed Ibrahim. I'm an Islamic law expert with the Department of uh, Peace Operations. Actually, I'm so glad to hear the USG Menendez mentioning uh, the necessity and the importance of having women on board while uh, in peacemaking and lawmaking process. However, I don't think it is enough to have them on board, but I think they need more than that. I recall I worked more than 10 years ago in Afghanistan and I had a meeting with uh, Afghan parliamentarians who came asking to meet with me as Islamic law expert, asking, they were complaining, actually, that uh, while discussing the budget with the spokesperson, he stopped them from talking, saying that your voice is illegal in Sharia to talk in general. It's aura, or it's sexy, and you cannot speak. And they asked me, is it true that we cannot debate uh, anything in the parliament? I said, of course it's not. Uh, would you kindly go back to him and tell him to read the Quran? There is a full chapter called 58. It's called the debate, which is al-mujadala. It is all about the women's right to debate for their rights, not only for in front of any person, but in front of the Prophet himself. So it is inherited in your religion and faith, and you own it, you cannot relinquish it. And since that day, actually, they were allowed to speak freely at the parliament. And I remember also that we thought, since that time, as international community, we established a technical office to support the parliamentarian women. So besides have them on board, I think it's extremely important to supply them with all kinds of supports, name it, political or technical or whatever support needed. Thank you. I think given our time constraints, I'll take two more questions and then come back to the panel for final reflections. So I've actually just got these two here, if I could. I'll, I'll pass it off to you afterwards. Oh, no. um, good afternoon. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm dressed for the travel. I'm leaving today, but I, I'm really moved um, to have the microphone and um, to share some of my comments and a question that might be a bit philosophical, but also practical. Um, I will be honest with you. Um, it's the second event today on masculinity, militarization, women, peace and security that I'm attending. Uh, not the second one in my life, but I think uh, the first or the second space where um, Something inside me feels really right about what is being said and how it's being said to the point that it's bringing me to tears. And I'm really, you know, constraining myself from being pathetic or a little bit, you know, moving. Um, but I think what I'm experiencing is 
the, the, the more conversations I would like to have about power from people who actually represent power, but know how to share it and know how to reflect their own privilege and use it to really give voice to other people. And I'm sad to know that I'm so, I've been so used to having conversations like this and just mute myself to it because I see men speaking at panels, I see generals, I see politicians, and they say the right words, but it doesn't come out the right way. I'm experiencing something very different here. and I just want to share it. Um, my question is, what does it take, do you think, for all of us, because I think we all can be in positions of power as women, uh, white women, privileged women, educated women uh, who serve less privileged women and men and boys, as men, as uh, people from the global north, we can all be in positions of power. What does it take for us not just to write policies that include but actually shift the consciousness so that when we are in power or the people who are in power actually feel what those policies talk about. And this is, as I said, it's a philosophical question, but it's also a practical one because I'm convinced that such training or such consciousness raising is imperative to go along with policy change. Without it, the policies are just um, you know, empty words. And uh, yeah, thank you even for the opportunity to reflect about that, even if you don't have the answers. Thank you for thinking together with you. Just wanted to add, um, Annalena Schluchte from the Peace Building Fund. I'm gonna give my spot to you actually, because I had a very, very similar question than what you just raised. It's about doing things right and um, doing the right thing. I think we all agree, but that means checking our privilege and especially maybe to reiterate what you said, what can we do better in terms of checking our privilege and our unconscious bias as men and women? Thank you so much for the excellent and encouraging panel. Uh, my name is Birjan Unver, and I am founder and president of the Light Millennium Organization. We are associated with the Department of Global Communications. I do have a challenging question, because uh, since um, perhaps uh, Obama set out uh, at the UN uh, General Assembly, freedom of religion is set out a tone, global tone, and that led Syria, Iraq, all that, in my opinion. However, what I want to come up here is that that also push out the secularism. I'm originally from Turkey. So when we have, when, we, when the religion of freedom on the political level is pushed too much, including within the UN system, then when it's not aligned with the freedom of expression on the equal level, and when the secularism is pushed away, then security issue threat for women in increase enormously. So how you put place, how we can make freedom of religion equal level, or how we can make freedom of expression equal importance to freedom of religion as it is now, it also, what is each panelist's standpoint on the secularism? For instance, Iraq is safer now, Syria is safer now, those were secular countries. Thank you. So I'm going to come back to the panelists now with what are very simple and straightforward questions. <laughs> um, we have how men and boys can be part of this really concretely as we talk about localization, um, uh, the importance of not just having men on board but having them really embedded in this issue, the practical steps, um, sharing power, um, and challenges around how we understand uh, the various contexts of peace and security, including grappling with really difficult issues regarding um, things like secularism, religion, et cetera. I'm going to give our panelists, our panelists have um, about eight minutes or so to share amongst themselves. I will start, do you want me to start that end? I will start with Fatima. أنا سأجيب على ما قالته زميلتنا آخر شيء إنه كيف 
يمكن أن يكون هنالك خلط بين حرية التعبير وحرية الأديان هنالك فرق بين حرية التعبير وحرية الأديان نحن في مجتمعاتنا تختلف المجتمع الأوروبي والأمريكي العربي يختلف طبيعة هذه المجتمعات تختلف في في طقوسها وفي مذاهبها وفي كل شيء نحن داخل مجتمعاتنا المحلية وحتى مجتمعاتنا حول نفرق بين التعبير وبين الأديان الدين يسمح للمرأة أن تتعلم الدين يسمح للمرأة أن تخرج الدين يسمح للمرأة أن تتكلم الدين يسمح للمرأة أن تشارك الرجل في كل مجالات العمل لكن الفهم الخاطئ لدينا الذي يمارس في مجتمعاتنا أن هنالك خلط بين الدين وبين التقاليد والأعراف ما يحدث الآن بالمجتمعات العربية ليس دين وحتى الذي وإنما دائما هي أعراف وتقاليد يفرضوها لا تخرجي للعمل لا تعملي لا تتكلمين مع الرجل هذه كلها أعراف وتقاليد فنحن نحاول من خلال عملنا أن نفرق بين الدين وبين هذه الأعراف الأعراف مغلوطة لكن الدين يسمح للمرأة أن تمارس دورها وها أنا بينكم في ملبسي وفي شيء لا يوجد أحد يمنعني من الحوار معكم أو يمنعني من المشاركة معكم والجلوس معكم Uh, I'd like to address the last questions from our colleagues. Uh, uh, the question was about how to balance between the freedom of expression and the freedom of religion. Uh, of course, there is a difference between uh, the different contexts. So I would say in Europe and the Arab world, there are differences in the way we confess and express expression and the practice of religion. In our society, we do actually distinguish between Uh, that between expressing our religion and practicing our religion. We know that religion allows women to go out, to, 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 to get education, to be part of the public space. The problem we have is the misunderstanding of the religion that some people in our countries do, which is mixing between religion and tradition or customs. Uh, in the Arab world now, what you see is uh, a confession or uh, embracing of um, traditions and customs, as I said. We try, and in our capacity, we try to distinguish between those and acknowledge that uh, customs can be sometimes problematic and have fallacies. I'm here talking among you. I came dressed the way I'm dressed in Iraq, and nobody prevented me from coming here. So that's something to think about, too. Thanks. I wanted to respond to the point about women mediators networks, and I would really like to encourage these. It can be uh, a little awkward, because one of the questions we get as the Nordic women mediators is, that's great, but is there actually any demand for you? <laughs> and the answer to that is not always. We're not at the stage yet where people automatically think we have to add some women mediators into this, into this mix. But By uniting women mediators un under a label, especially regionally, you uh, loom larger as an advertisement for the fact that women mediators exist. And in any region of the world, you can now find women with experience as, uh, as mediators, and it helps reinforce us in these roles. Just one, one line. So <clears throat> while I do agree that in many ways we need to continue to build capacity of women and these mediators network and trainings. I actually think to build this empathy and to attack power, we actually need to train men and to change both the approach to daily life as well as how we make policy. So, so I, I would like to equally encourage my Ukrainian friends to not just defend who are the women mediators in civil society, but how do we tackle the very militarized tradition of Eastern Europe we still carry. I guess I'd make three quick points. Uh, first of all, a lot of the questions that have been asked are actually addressed in the guiding principles that we have there. Uh, the charter that we've released gives our overall you know, judgment, views, assessment. The guiding principles address the tough questions. And so on the question of how do you make sure that men don't dominate in this agenda, look, you know, look at guiding principle five where we talk about men conveying agreed upon messages, 
acknowledging the leadership of women and women's institutions, acknowledging their own ally status, supporting women's leadership, and avoiding mansplaining. And in all of those uh, steps, it's important to recognize that you're an ally you're, and that you're not taking a leadership role because you're not a knight on a white horse coming to rescue a damsel in distress. What you're trying to do is to use your influence and power that you've built up over a lifetime to say, I'm not really the one who should be talking to you. It's Fatima from Iraq who ought to be in this meeting instead of me. And you have that capacity to open doors. Yeah. Second thing is, it isn't just about diversity and faces. It's about inclusion as well. Yeah. I am the diversity and inclusion advisor for all of the US NGOs working through interaction. And I often say that if all you're doing is creating a diverse institution without changing the power dynamics, without a, taking advantage of those different viewpoints to avoid you know, group think that's gonna cause you problems, it's like you've bought a, a car and you've paid for the car and you're leaving it in the garage. Uh, you need to be able to take advantage. You need critical mass. And you also need to trust your people, to empower them, to speak on behalf of the organization. And are you going to get mistakes? Yes. But you're going to get a lot of more mistakes being avoided. The final point I wanted to make is that one of the motivations when we went out to talk with a number of the generals and the former foreign ministers and the ambassadors who were men, one of the advantages that they saw was an opportunity to improve their knowledge of the situation. Because you know, for most people who rise to a certain level, you lose track of grassroots, yeah. younger, yes. more indigenous, with quotes around that, uh, points of view. And so a lot of the people that I was talking with said, yeah, I'd love to do this, but it's not just opening doors. I want to be educated. I want to learn the reality of the ground so I don't make a stupid mistake. When I was the US ambassador in Angola, when a woman human rights advocate would speak uh, publicly, the first thing, when I first got there, I would go on television and say, isn't this great? We have a woman who's willing to stand up. I soon learned that in some cases, I was putting a target on her back by doing that. And so what I learned to do was to have my political advisor go to that person and say, what do you want? Do you want me to embrace you, to wrap the American flag around you, to in effect say, you mess with her, you're messing with the United States? Or is that the least you'd yeah. ever want? And, you, and it, it involves trusting other individuals to take the lead yeah to be responsible for their own actions. And frankly, from my perspective, it was great because I wasn't responsible anymore. I was doing what they were asking me to do. So I just throw that out. Thank you. That was, thank you. A perfect, a perfect note. Um, a perfect note to end this panel discussion on um, getting at exactly what we're talking about with this initiative. For the final comments, Sahana, I welcome you to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the panelists who have participated today. And I'd like to especially thank our partners, International Peace Institute, um, Strategy for Humanity, the OSF team, uh, Lexi Van Veskerk, who's been behind the scenes helping make the event possible and the launch possible, and particularly like to thank Ambassador Dan Steinberg for his leadership on moving this partnership forward. Um, I'm just gonna say a few remarks to tell you a little bit about our secure future um, and to let you know about some of the resources that Ambassador Steinberg mentioned that are now on our website that you can not only read the charter, but also uh, uh, sign up, get information, uh, 
I'll tell you a little bit about that. But first I wanted to say our Secure Futures mission is to strengthen the women, peace, and security movement. And we're looking for strategic entry points to, to advance this agenda. And I really believe that there can be nothing more strategic than leveraging the principles of partnership and equality. But, and what we've done today and started a conversation on is the question of what kind of partnership can that be? What kind of partners can men be? I really think this is our opportunity to examine this question closely, to identify and be honest about the real challenges to equality and partnership that so many of you have raised, both on the panel and in the audience, and to name what we must let go of in order to move forward together and transform peace and security for all of us. Our secure future is in this with you. We are a Colorado-based foundation, but we're very active in DC and New York and with the Women, Peace and Security community of practice. And that's our job is to support this community of practice and have this kind of conversation. And it really pleased me so much. It made me feel like we did something right when we have people in the audience saying, this is a different kind of conversation. This is the kind of conversation I want to have and be part of. That was terrific. Um, and as Ambassador Don Steinberg has been saying, we are engaging with a number of partners and stakeholders to move this forward and really examine and find new roles for men as partners. Um, one of the things we'd love to do is welcome you to join the network. Go to our website. Um, it's live now, oursecurefuture.org. Um, you'll find it under the projects uh, down uh, window. And you can find the charter, read the principles. You can sign the charter there. You can sign up uh, to share and uh, receive new information updates and to help us connect high level partners with local leaders. You'll also see some other publications and projects that we feel really proud of and hope contribute to this conversation. Some of those publications are in the back. Our latest publication is a selected annotated bibliography on the evidence of effectiveness of women, peace, and security. As Adam Rubel pointed out and a few other panelists also pointed out, this argument for effectiveness is very important to this agenda. And finally, I just wanted to say I am a feminist, and I think that one of the greatest gifts of feminism to the world has been to ask questions, and questions about who has power and why, and how can we change that unequal power structure. I feel like today, as we launch this Mobilizing Men Partners, Men as Partners Network, um, is the beginning of that kind of a conversation. And we're really delighted to be moving forward with all of you on this. So thank you so much to everyone who's come and participated in the, in the conversation, to all of our panelists. And this is just the beginning, and we're really looking forward to working with all of you over the next two years. Thank you so much, everyone. Please read the materials and, um, and talk with the colleagues about uh, these opportunities. Thank you again.